Hi, I'm Rafael Gomez, host of Speaking Freely here on TLN, and now host of our mayoral candidate interviews. Over the last several weeks, we've been interviewing the top mayoral candidates for this city's mayoral election, which is going to occur on June 26th. And today we have Mitzi Hunter. Mitzi was an MPP, I say was, because uh, she was an MPP here in the province of Ontario, but she stepped down from her seat to run as one of this city's mayoral candidates. So she took a brave step forward, and we have her here to talk about why she did that. Thank you, Mitzi. Thank you for having me, Raphael. And as I started these interviews, I've allowed the candidates to sort of tell us why they got in the race. What was their motive? And I know you have a big uh, feeling about this, that you think this is actually one of the most important and critical pieces of like what motivated you. Because unlike our city councillors who run this race, they can actually go back to being city councillors. You threw that opportunity out. You, you just have to get rid of your MPP seat when you decide to run for a position like mayor. So tell us why you're, tell the audience why you decided to do that. Yeah, I mean, I, I knew that I had to step away from being the MPP of my wonderful community in Scarborough. I've mm -hmm. been a champion for the last 10 years and um, the rules as they are require MPPs to step down to run uh, mm -hmm. in a municipal election. So I actually have until May 12th in, okay. order, to, uh, in order to do that. My commitment, though, is uh, is to go the full distance. I'm in it to win it, and you know we have an amazing city. I grew up in Scarborough, and um, and for those of us who aren't in the city of Toronto, <laughs> Scarborough's in the east end of the city. It was a city unto itself, and we might get into that later. Yeah. Uh, and, and there's a lot of pride for people who come from Scarborough. Oh well, if you've heard of uh, people like The Weeknd mm. and you know mm. uh, Mike Myers, mm. Bare Naked Ladies, right. uh, there's a lot of Scarborough pride. Mm -hmm. And I'm proud to be a kid from Scarborough. This is you know my community, and to have represented it for the last decade. Mm. What I know is though that just as I was a champion in our community in Scarborough, I want to be that champion across the whole city. Mm. I believe that we need to have a revival in Toronto and I want the city to work mm. for everyone everywhere. Mm. That's extremely important. I'm hearing that a lot, this idea of a revival, which implies that what's happening now is not the best situation, that there's a city that's maybe not firing on all its cylinders. Can you maybe speak to what you think is is wrong in the city or to not to be so extreme or maybe I'm what's broken in the city and that you want to fix oh for sure you know just just look at the state of the sense of safety on the tr Toronto transit system the TTC mm -hmm. you know people are afraid to take it and if we don't get our ridership numbers up that's gonna be a huge risk for Toronto moving forward we're a world-class global city you mm. have to have a transit system mm. that moves people around and safety mm. is very very important mm -hmm. um, you know you walk around and you see this homelessness is much more visible in our city than perhaps it was before we've actually just hit record numbers of people who are experiencing homelessness in February of this year mm. and you know I believe we have to address those issues the issue of affordability you know can young people really feel like they can grow up here uh, w educate themselves get a job but can they afford to live here you know can they rent an apartment or buy a house. Many of them don't have that dream anymore. Mm. And that's something that we have to address because that's the talent we need to drive the economic development in our city moving forward. Right. So um, I'm going to pull you maybe into a specific issue because it's one that you've taken a stance that a majority of the candidates haven't. And it has to do with a community in the city and maybe uh, an institution that many people know from, from having visited the city. It's the Ontario Science Centre. And over the last several weeks, it's actually come to dominate a bit of the discussions around the mayoral candidacy. Now, you had an interesting perspective um, before we started the interview. You actually think this is more of a litmus test because the view you take on this actually speaks to broader issues. Uh, people are saying it's limiting to talk about one institution, the Ontario Science Centre, where it may or may not be moved to. But you, in fact, feel it reveals more about the candidates and their vision of the city than people might understand. So do you want to maybe elaborate and tell people what the issue is and where you stood on, where you stand on this issue? Yeah, well, first of all, the Ontario Science Centre, just like Ontario Place, it was, you know, built at, uh, in, in 1967. So this is, uh, you know, five decades this institution has been there as a place of science and experiential learning 
for students, for young people, and for families, mm -hmm. uh, because the facility is is quite uh, quite quite big. It's on 90 acre mm -hmm. property that's built into the ravine, mm -hmm. and uh, and it's largely served as the green space in this community and in, in this neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And we have to contextualize this because it's a it's a, a priority neighborhood. There's a lot of density around it. Um, you know, a lot of uh, social housing mm -hmm. around it. I have to say that when you know I'm an immigrant here as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. um, my family moved to Canada from Jamaica, mm. and my grandmother lived mm. in Flemington Park, right across from the Science, the Science Center. Center. And that's still a home to recent immigrants. Still a home yeah. to recent immigrants. So I remember it. I remember, mm. Mm. you know, just that feeling of this great big place mm -hmm. and a place of wonder. Mm -hmm. And and when you know the thought was to pick it up and put it on the water, uh, you know, down by Ontario Place. You know, I, I thought, well, wait a minute. What about the people who live, you know, north mm -hmm. in the city, mm -hmm. or, or you know, who don't have opportunity to go downtown for attraction and for experiences? What about them? We need to think about having, a, you know, public mm -hmm. public assets across the city, not yeah. just in the downtown. Mm -hmm. And I really believe that the candidates that are, are mayoralty candidates in this race, um, their perspective on this is really important because it tells us what they think about the city mm. and how, how they will make yeah. decisions. Because some have endorsed and embraced this plan. And uh, just to put one like finer point on it, it's not as if we're adding a cultural institution. It, we're talking about closing one down and then just re removing it and putting it in a new place. And I think that's just such a small thought from a big city, right, that we're not adding to cultural institutions, we're reducing them. It just doesn't make sense. Yeah. I, and I, I believe that with the, um, the attraction mm -hmm. of uh, new public transit in yeah. the Don Mills community mm -hmm. in Flemington Park, mm -hmm. we have the Eglinton Crosstown mm -hmm. stop right mm -hmm. there, mm -hmm. and the, on, the Ontario line, line the mm -hmm. new Ontario line. It's going to drive a renaissance mm -hmm. in our community, right in Don Mills, right at that intersection. Why would we take away mm -hmm. that public space instead of enhancing it, mm -hmm. you know, building it up? Of course, let's put some, you know, high rises on the parking lot area mm -hmm. and, and let's mm -hmm. create more amenities and more services for the community that already lacks that. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what I'm fighting for. I'm fighting for a city that works for everyone everywhere and we don't want to take away from mm -hmm. the community we mm -hmm. want to add to it mm -hmm. and because we need to be building for the people who actually live in the city and creating wonderful experiences for them mm. so i think you explained that well like that's an emblematic case of a bigger philosophy around the city maybe walk us through then a couple of other uh, issues that have been come to dominate you mentioned the security issue the safety issue the feeling of public disorder the other issue that I've, I've noticed and, and I've heard from people and when I bring up all the time is recovery, uh, the post-pandemic, especially along our main streets, which in the city like Toronto and especially in Scarborough, um, the main streets are, might look different, but they're inhabited by largely small businesses, independent businesses, lar lo many and in, in largely um, set up by recent immigrants or immigrants to this country, and they were hit very hard during the last two and a half, three years. The closures fell mostly on their storefronts. Uh, Walmarts and Costco's stayed open, they had to close. How do we help revive those main streets and those small business sector that I think was really, really hurt? And you, you see it in the suburban parts of the city, what we call the strip malls, uh, have a lot of vitality and a lot of uh, entrepreneurship and a lot of creativity. Do you have any ideas around that, like reviving our main streets and helping support our small independent businesses? Oh, for sure. Um, you know, so I've served in the provincial le legislature, been a cabinet minister for some of the largest portfolios. And so, you know, when the pandemic hit, I, as the finance critic, I served on the finance committee that listened to a lot of those small businesses that w was appealing mm -hmm. to governments mm -hmm. in terms of the closure. And mm -hmm. I actually became an advocate for them, really fought for the government to really listen to those small businesses and provide uh, response that they needed and not just you know big box stores and large retailers you know they have a place but the small businesses you know those are our employers and mm -hmm. those are you know many 
many small businesses um, are led by individuals and that that serves as the income for that family mm -hmm. and so you know the fact that they've been hardest hit and uh, and you can see it you can see it on, on many of the ones that have closed the restaurant sector in particular mm -hmm. has felt it very very hard those those independent uh, mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. And we know that Scarborough, coming back to yeah. that, food has, capital has of the a world. food capital of the world. Mm -hmm. And you know, so so we have to make sure that we have, you know, pay attention to that. How do they come back? You know, their major employers. They're, you know, the many of them say they can't find people to mm -hmm. hire in their in their mm -hmm. businesses anymore, or the cost is too high for them. So there are many challenges that we face. Mm -hmm. To, to revive our city and to, to lead that revival, we have to have a small business sector that is thriving. Mm -hmm. And we need to have policies in our, in our city level of government mm -hmm. that is responsive to them. So give us maybe one or two tangible mm -hmm. uh, policies that would help mm -hmm. that sector and help revive, because people think it's about e choosing economic development versus um, other, other uh, priorities like our parks or our, our social services. But the two are intertwined because if you don't have a vital um, main street, mm -hmm. people don't go out and they won't even use the amenities that you have, like the local public library, because it just won't feel safe or worthwhile going. Um, so just maybe speak to some of that. Like what would be the, a tangible policy that would help uh, that sector? Well, I certainly support the uh, Cafe Tio. Mm -hmm. um, that was something that I thought was really smart that the city would allow you know, sort of that outdoor dining right. so that, you know, there could be more distancing mm -hmm. and that safety. So making that a permanent part mm -hmm. of our city mm -hmm. uh, is really important. Yeah. It needs to be affordable yeah. uh, for the, That's the, what we've heard, the local they're, restaurants. They're now being charged for something that yeah. was kind of free during the pandemic. Um, so you're saying maybe get rid of those fees or at least lower them or subsidize the businesses that can't afford it? Absolutely, and, uh. and listening to, to the needs that they have because, you know, from, from their perspective, and, and I've talked to small business owners, particularly restaurant owners, and what they've said to me is, you know, Mitzi, we've mortgaged our house, mm -hmm. we've, we've you know, really mm -hmm. held on and we didn't mm -hmm. want to close our doors, mm -hmm. uh, so give us a chance to recover. Mm -hmm. and, and so we need to give them a chance to recover uh, so that, as you said, this adds to the public realm. Yeah. This adds to the vitality mm. in in our in our communities. Another aspect that they talk about all the time is labor, mm. and and where are they going to get you know the skills that they need to bring into um, into their businesses? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's an aspect as well is making sure that we have employment related mm. programs and services that true. provides that steady stream of labor. I think. The city oftentimes wants the big employer to come to the city, mm -hmm. and they do everything that they can. They roll up the red carpet, they give them tax breaks. When in fact, you look at a community, say in Scarborough, where I grew up was Wexford. Uh, we did an, yeah. a study, you know this the area, and yeah, it's full do. of great restaurants. And But the, there were about 200 and odd businesses, each one employing about four or five people on average. That's the equivalent of, of a big box store that's located far away. So the, the totality of this employment generation is quite big. People are often located in their communities, so they're not traveling as far, so that's good for everyone, the environment, and so on. Um, so I think that's the missing piece, that when you showcase that you're not just helping one individual small business, these policies help a whole community kind of stand alone and, and revive, revive itself, right? Well, I have to say, Raphael, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, in the early 90s, yeah. I had a small business of my own okay. in Wexford oh, yeah, at yeah. Pharmacy in Lawrence. That's where I grew up. <laughs> there you go, and um, you know, and it, it really was wonderful for me as mm -hmm. as a young person having my own business, really learning that skill of creating something for yourself. Mm -hmm. I want that for young people today. Mm -hmm. I want them to feel that Toronto is a, a place that they can afford to grow up and you know be innovators, be entrepreneurs. We need to support them in getting those businesses started mm -hmm. and locating here. Yeah, absolutely. Now, maybe shifting a, a little bit of gears, just talk about that, that journey you had as a small business owner, a provincial parliamentarian, and now running for uh, the city's uh, mayoral uh, seat. Um, we're here in the northwest part of the city. We're in uh, TLN, which is a multicultural, the largest multicultural station in Canada. What's interesting is as diverse as our city has become, and you've had successive waves of immigration. TLN, of course, started with the Italian community, but broadened out to Latin American and, and uh, Portuguese-speaking communities and, and all multicultural communities kind of find a home with TLN. 
it's, it, they're everywhere. Our diversity is seen everywhere in culture, in, in entertainment, as you mentioned, but not in politics. It's still a very, I would say, uh, traditionally dominated sector. Mm -hmm. How have you found, just to speak more personally, that journey of coming from a community of immigrants um, and making your way through kind of a political culture that's still kind of very traditional? Yeah. I mean, first of all, growing up in Scarborough, it, it like, Every culture is there. Mm -hmm. And when I was studying at the university at UTSC mm. um, during my undergrad, we actually really noticed a bit of xenophobia that students who were from the Caribbean would kind of hang together, mm. um, Tamil students mm. would hang together, mm. and everyone would be in their own little, little group. So we created a program, my um, friends and I, called Mosaic. Mm -hmm. And Mosaic was about cultural diversity and how do we talk to each other, whether through food or mm -hmm. dance mm -hmm. or music. And we had a week-long celebration, cultural dialogue and expression. Mm -hmm. It was so successful mm -hmm. that the university asked us to run it again a second year, which we did. And then we made it permanent. So, you know, 20 years later, you still have Mosaic on campus. I've heard of it. it, it well, there you go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. But I started that. Oh, excellent. <laughs> and so that's, that's a reflection of mm -hmm. our multicultural community. So when I was running, I was asked to run um, by the Ontario Liberal Party. Kathleen Wynne was the first woman to be premier. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was, it was a very easy response for me because public service was something that I believed in and I wanted to make a difference. In specifically in people's lives. And that's what it is all about. How do we make our community better? The community that I grew up in and, you know, that has, has just been such a wonderful place. Mm -hmm. How do I improve upon that? And so, so I jumped in and I ran and, of course, I won the by-election in 2013 on August the 1st, which is Emancipation Day. Mm -hmm. So it was a very symbolic moment for me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I thought of my grandmother mm. and um, just all the sacrifices she made to bring our family here mm -hmm. and, and to keep our family together. Mm. Um, you know, she always had these big family gatherings and we would all go over. And, and so that, that was an important moment for me, you know, seeing that, yes, I can do this. But my journey in politics has been just extraordinary. You know, I'm the first black woman to be minister of education, the first person of any color mm -hmm. to, to hold that yeah. portfolio yeah. and to and to really see our education system through new and different eyes. Mm -hmm. And what difference can we make for students as they're learning, recognizing that representation does matter. It mm -hmm. is important mm -hmm. and is a factor. So mm -hmm. one of the things that I was able to do was implement an education equity secretariat within the ministry to, to help to look at some of the challenges mm -hmm. that racialized and other mm -hmm. students were facing in terms of their graduation and their success within our education system. That aspect of showing up and being at the table is very important. Mm -hmm. You know, I had role models like Jean Augustine, mm -hmm. Alvin Curling, mm -hmm. you know, they were accessible to me. And I always say to students and to young people, if you can see me, you can be me. And that representation is extremely important. Now I'm running for mayor mm -hmm. of Toronto. And I say, it's about time, mm -hmm. that it is time that someone who grew up in Scarborough, uh, has lived in this city, has hands-on experience within politics, but brings a fresh set of eyes to the challenges that we face as a city, that it is time. You're in it to win it, as I'm you said earlier. I'm in early. it to win it. And, and one thing you reminded me of is growing up in Scarborough is like your DEI training, right? You yes. live it. And uh, I share those experiences too. Yeah. Well, yeah. thank you for joining us, Mitzi. Oh. Thank and, you. And I uh, wish you all the best of luck. Yeah. And to our viewers, join us for our next mayoral candidate interview.